Welcome to Showbiz Chicago for Podcast. Well, I have just got done seeing Christmas Schooner for probably the 15th time, and I've cried every time. <laughs> You're a good man. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie Brown. <laughs> and I am here with one of my old friends and a new friend. Hello, hello. Hello. So why don't you introduce yourselves to our Showbiz Chicago family? Hi, I'm uh, Mark Costin. Yes, I play you young man and Carl at age 15. And I'm uh, Ron Keaton, and I play Oscar... Oscar, the, Oscar, Oscar the Grouch, <laughs> who, make, who makes a cameo appearance that's in right, here. That's right. So, well, why don't we discuss, I mean, you've been doing this show for how many years now? Uh, this is my fourth time doing it, I think. Um, there are people in the cast who have done Mr. this. Mr. Sherman, uh, my God. Mr. Sherman's done it, I believe, eight, nine, ten times. Right. Um, so what is the hook of this show? Actually, the hook is, it, it, it's kind of a double hook. There it is. Uh, family right. and tradition, to be perfectly honest. Um, by establishing a, uh, uh, an offshoot of an old tradition in Germany, taking the trees. Uh, let me backtrack. Let me, tra- let me backtrack. The play, uh, The Christmas Schooner, is uh, based uh, on a true story, an amalgam of stories. But uh, uh, a true story of uh, a schooner that hauled uh, uh, small pine trees uh, of all varieties from the UP in Michigan down at Lake Michigan to Chicago in the middle and late 1800s. Um, Yes, they are based on true stories of ships that did uh, bring trees to Chicago, trees that did, uh, uh, ships that did go down. Uh, in uh, the, uh, the tragic uh, winter uh, weather over the lake. Anyone in, in Chicago has seen that from right. time to time. <laughs> and um, uh, it makes a story of such, uh, such proportion, and yet the intimacy with which it's offered by the authors is uh, so timely and so, so uh, 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 personal in its, right. uh, in its thing. That uh, uh, yeah, it's become a very Chicago-centric show. Yes, absolutely, it? yes, it has. absolutely. You know, and with productions like I was at the original Bailiwick production mm-hmm. many years ago, mm-hmm. and then Theater at the Center in Indiana did it. But it's always had this core following. It seems like you know. Absolutely, we've had. I've seen people out in the audience who I recognize from last year. Absolutely, and there have been people who have attended the show already this year who have come back. Yeah. So this so. is your second year, Mark? This is my second year. And this is your fourth? This is my fourth time. Yeah. So as actors, um, how do you keep a part fresh? I feel... And especially in a like, show like this that's... Yeah, I mean, absolutely. the emotional, it runs the emotional gamut. Absolutely. You get everything. Um, the, the comedy, the love mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of sorrow in it, too. After doing it... Last year, and now we have another year coming back. As people just in life, you go through new experiences. You have a lot of uh, new emotions that are there. So just not choosing to stick with something that you've done before, not being afraid to try something new, and just dive right into the new emotional aspects that each scene can have if you allow it to. Um, And you also look at it from the professional side. Absolutely. the actor is, uh, uh, by his very job, supposed to make each moment fresh for the audience. True. And if he does not do that, then, frankly, he's not doing his job. Right. Uh, so that freshness has to come from a combination of the actor's own technique mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, emotion of the moment. It works, uh, it works almost every time for me when I watch that little scene near the end with mm. the little girl and mm-hmm. all of talking scene. about that. Mm-hmm. Every time those two get together, it tugs at me. Yeah. Uh, partially, I think, I'm going to tell you something a little personal. I didn't realize I would <laughs> <Uh-oh>. do this. <laughs> when I was a kid, I didn't have a Christmas tree until I was 19 years old. Hmm. Because it just wasn't one of those things that happened in my house. And so uh, I didn't always understand... Uh, as a boy, the emotion uh, that was wrapped around the Christmas tree itself. Interesting. When I got to college and I saw trees in the dormitory and trees decorated all across campus and then going to friends' houses and seeing it all decorated up, uh, 
It was a new introduction to Christmas for me. Wow. It's a symbol, isn't it? It's Not a, just a symbol. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a personal identification for a lot of people. They cannot have Christmas without uh, a, a Christmas, Christmas tree. tree. Hmm. That's interesting. Nineteen. Well, yeah, I was 19 once, I promise you. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to verify that on Wikipedia, but, but we'll, see. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see. If you find an article about me in Wikipedia, I'll give you money. <laughs> I might write one. I've long, you know, known you a long time now. I might write one just for you. Thank you. So from a director and actress standpoint then, um, being with the show now a couple of years, has the direction changed with new actors coming in? And, and as actors, reacting to new actors coming into this project, how is that with a show so emotionally challenging as this? Yeah. Um, some aspects have changed. Uh, definitely the, the way things are said sometimes absolutely changes, which also changes uh, your listening right. and how you're responding to that. I think that was one of the main things that Walter Stearns kept on reminding us, is to just make sure you're listening. You know, make sure you're connecting with the person who's on stage with you, which was a wonderful note every single time. He's very much an uh, actor's director. Yeah. That he is. Uh, his, his, his greatest asset is in finding those people who can do what he wants them to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any good director can do that. Hey, you know, that's half the battle. Absolutely. Things like blocking-wise traffic where people are uh, pretty much the same, I'd say. So, uh, there is some timing difference from one actor to another yeah. uh, in, in line delivery, in how jokes are offered, uh, uh, that kind of thing. But in essence, the spirit and the, the honesty of it is pretty much the same. The it truth. has to be. It's always about the I truth. I feel like it? it's even stronger this year. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, in what way? I don't know. You know, going back to what I said before about just coming in with a new year, uh, new experiences within life, everybody is just bringing a lot more to the table, I feel. There's just an, an energy, a, a spirit in the room that you could just you'd feel it. It's palpable. So from a, a younger actor's standpoint, oh, thank you. What, what are you <laughs> learning from people like Ron and Jim Sherman, who, you know, they're Chicago acting institutions? Yeah. What, what do you take away from them? Their professionalism, both on stage and off stage, it's good to also see uh, people who are still in it because they love to do what they do. You know, you sometimes you just meet people, you're like, you have been in this business for far too long, <laughs> like you're a little too jaded, you know, like, please, just hang up the hat already. But they're just wonderful people, lovely people who are always on point. Um, and also with connecting with other people on stage, it's just great to see the eye contact is just great. That's something that Jim and I share a lot of in one of our last scenes is just awesome eye contact, which really pulls you in sure. um, when you're on stage with somebody. And the same question to you. What do you learn from a younger actor like Mark? That I need to keep my energy up. <laughs> um, and, and to be perfectly honest, that's not as difficult as it sounds. Uh, you get juiced. You get, uh, you get excited knowing, uh, first of all, that uh, there is someone with this young man's energy who can look at me, uh, you know, in a, in a line, in a chuckle on stage or whatever, and make me give it back. <laughs> that's what it's all about, the exchange between actors. It doesn't matter about the age, but in this particular dynamic, uh, yeah, I want to keep up. I want to show them I still have th something to offer, <laughs> you you know, just as peers, uh, if nothing else. But certainly in the job, um, it is about professionalism. Yeah. It is about, Definitely. you know, not, yeah, not just hitting your mark, but hitting it with purpose and uh, knowing that the person over there is listening to you as you tell the truth. And I feel like your personality and your professionalism goes so much further than, like for everyone, then your talent. Like there's tons of talented people, but there's people that just carry themselves so well right. that that's what extends them farther. As you so get to older, see. you uh, you realize that it's not just talent that carries you through. Yeah, it is absolutely. the it is the uh, the patience you have to develop and the willingness to grow. Yeah, that makes you keep walking that walk. And yeah. if you don't, then you're right. You don't belong here. 
Well, awesome. Let's name some actors we don't like. That. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Right, that gets me in trouble far too often. So, okay, I'm going to approach this next question from a critical standpoint. Sure. Because um, the script is very, the characters are very overbroad. Yes. Yes, they, they really are. are. So, what challenges do you face by that as actors to, to make like backstories and things like that. It doesn't change the technique at all. It, you still create the story. You still right. know who, who you are, where you came from when you walk into the scene. You still know where you're headed when you go out. Within the scene, in such a, uh, uh, in a broader cut, as you say, um, it is your job to still uh, make it identifiable for the audience. And, because in the end, uh, the reason the actor does it is for the audience. It's for yeah. that feedback, that exchange, that, I, I use the word energy again. Um, why else would an actor stand out there by himself if he doesn't want somebody to hear what he has right. to say? The old actor's ego. Exactly. <laughs> it is ego to a point. It is. Uh, but that ego works along with what you've learned to make it honest. And it's all about the relationship, too, you know, not just the people that you are sharing mm -hmm. the stage with, mm -hmm. but the audience. You know, if, uh, if the audience is having a bit of an off day, it's going to change what we are doing on stage, how things are said, and the intent of why they're said. It shouldn't, but it does. It does. So you it does. But it has to. It, it has a, to It's adapt. a living organism. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. and the energy is different mm -hmm. every, yeah. you know, every performance. Yep. The energy can be different every 30 seconds, depending on yeah. you know, what's happening. It is. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So you play um, the older Carl, the son of the... Um, Peter and Alma. Yes. Yes. And your father is the one that gets <laughs> blown, <laughs> kind of blown away. But um, so playing the older character, because the younger character is also in here, it's kind of like the main yeah, yeah, yeah. story, the older, younger mm -hmm. um, Patrick. Um, did you study your colleague? And how does that... Because your man... I don't know if you realize it, but a lot of your mannerisms were alike. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of just watching him see exactly how he does certain things and trying to pick that up a little bit. But I also kept in mind that this is somebody who has aged well, so those mannerisms may have changed. Um, a lot of times when I am in my first act and I'm playing my young man, I'm not Carl yet, there are times where um, Benjamin and I are, I'm standing right upstage of him and I just feel like I am looking right through him watching the scene wow. as that person. So a lot of what happens in act one, I view them as a memory. You know, just like I remember the time that we you know, uh, marched around the kitchen table and Opa and Alma just weren't fighting anymore. You know, it, it's great that we have those moments. I feel very lucky that I can do that. And let's talk about your voice. Sure. My God, you've got a beautiful voice. Thank you. And a, a tenor, I take it. Sometimes. Wow. <laughs> so what, what is your background? What is your training? And how did you get involved in theater? Um... That's a good question. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> I'm like, how did I? Um, well, I, I started kind of at a young age in, uh, in middle school. What was I, the show that you first saw that said, hey, I need to do that? Um, the thing I first did was uh, I played Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof <laughs> Junior in middle school. Can you believe that? Isn't that hysterical? I had like a fake beard and everything. Wow. And the, uh, like, I, I uh, finished uh, If I Were a Rich Man. And I just, like, I know the moment where it just, like, it bit me, like, right in the butt. I was like, this is awesome. I really want to do it. And then, uh... I and don't think people... I've ever heard somebody that young say, hey, I play Tevia, and that was my key into theater. No, I, I, <laughs> no, would, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. a first mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> just keeping you on your toes. Right. Um, and then, you know, got, I decided that I wanted to get more involved in it when I went into high school, and then you um, had people telling me that I was kind of good, so then you think, oh, I got a little bit of talent, so why not try and use it? And then, um, and then graduating high school, I, uh, I got cast in a show right away, and I've just been 
kind of working a little bit ever since. I didn't really uh, go to school for training or anything like that. Um, just well, you're very natural, skills. and you've got a magnificent voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's talk about your history, because. <laughs> Well, excuse me then. <laughs> right, right, your musical theater, your musical theater history. <laughs> you know, the first thing that got me going was when I was six years old, and I watched on TV uh, a showing of uh, Danny Kaye and the Inspector General. Wow. And I thought, God, he's having fun. That's what I want to do. Um, the first show I ever did was a production of the Amish musical Plain and Fancy <laughs> back in 19... <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> I'm probably the only one in here <coughs> yeah. that has the um, cast requirement for Plain and Fancy. I hear you. <laughs> um, and uh, I, there, there's, a, there's a song in there that I can do to this day, which I won't do all of, but it, it's an alphabet song. Mm -hmm. Where uh, all the vegetables that the uh, the Amish uh, collected for raising the barn, so to speak, uh, that was the first thing I ever did on stage. Asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, <laughs> dandelion <laughs> greens, and escarole, fennel and grapes, and honeydew melon, and iceberg lettuce for the salad. Bo yes. It went on and on like that. Wow. You remember stuff like that when, yeah, you did. when it's your first one. Um, I was very lucky in that I started in summer stock theater when I was 16 years old. Uh, I've been an actor now for 42 years. I've been very lucky. I still always working. I, I do my best. I have my down times just like everybody else. But you know what, Michael? I I don't know what else I would do with my life. Yeah. And that's the kind of commitment that you need in this business to be able to survive. Right. There is still a cadre of people who are in my category, mid to late 50s and older, who are still at it, still actors you know. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything else. How have you seen the theater industry change? Whoa, we need a bottle of scotch for that. <laughs> uh, All right, get my bag. No. <laughs> it, well, it has changed. Um, and I don't know if it's because of my own evolution or what, but the business itself has gotten younger and more of, 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 of um, I want to say immediate, but that's not the word I want. Uh, everything it seems like it has to be successful right now, or if it's not, then there's something wrong with it. The, the, the thing that I lament about the changes is that we don't any longer give ourselves any room to fail, to let material grow, to develop it, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. And that's, a, that, I, 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 that's something that we all need to be aware of. Uh, there are shows out there that ha could have a wonderful future if they were given the right amount of time to develop what they are. Yeah. And... Uh, these days, we, 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 we as, as an audience, we as producers, we capture the big bucks immediately without allowing the true development of the piece to come along as it should. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. It does make sense. And, and to that point, Ron, is especially with so social media out yeah. there now yeah. and the way things, I mean, it's so instantaneous and everybody's a critic, it hurts new work. Not only hurts new work, it inhibits its 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 creation. It yes. does. It does. You know, because, because it gets out there. Everybody's a critic, yeah. and then yeah. you have all the financiers. If there's you know producing backers saying, "Oh, wait a minute," mm -hmm. you know. And as a playwright myself, I find it extremely difficult to get people to look at new work because they don't want to take a chance on something they don't know. A perfect example. Look what just happened on Broadway with David Mamet's with David new play. With David piece, yes. Uh, you know, yes. Cody, Pat, Patty LuPone has been waiting for this for mm -hmm. how many years? Yep. You know, canceled another revival. Mm -hmm. And what, it's playing three weeks. It's yeah. closing this week. While right down the street, a revival of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is going gangbusters. Yes. yes. Because they know the yes. material. Yes. So. You know, but... Yeah, that's a great example, though. Well, it's just the we keep the, moving on because that's what you do in this business. You keep moving to the next job. Occasionally, your good fortune will allow you to experience something very special, like this show. Absolutely. And uh, you take that with you along the way. Um, for the both of you, what do you think makes Chicago actors different 
the way you're trained and the way shows are developed and produced here different than a New York trained actor or an LA trained actor? Um, what changed? I, I think what is most different about Chicago is our community. Um, we have a wonderful kind of network of people who that you always run into and it's just a bunch of friendships around. That's a very good and, point. You know, they really just, those people are helping you. Yeah you're, yeah, you're competition for each other, but there's so much encouragement for everyone to just do well and do a good job that it, it's not so intimidating or cutthroat. And that's something, that's something you would rarely, if ever, find in New York. Yeah. The, there is a community, in a, in a broader sense, that that takes care of itself. In this business, we all have to take care of each other. And and uh, I'm I'm want to want to say uh, so few people in our business really practice that. Mm -hmm. We do that amongst ourselves because we know that you know if I don't get the job, that guy over there is just as uh, talented as I feel I might be. You know, right. he can use it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my absolutely. turn's next. Do I want all the jobs I get? Of course, but. I'm not stupid. You, you have to be realistic and know that uh, in any well, uh, all the water has to be spread around. So in the sense of how that changes your technique and stuff like that, how you asked, is that it, uh, it allows you to be a little bit more fearless. You know, people aren't going to, yeah, people are going to have their opinions on your work, but people are out there that care about you and they want you to do a good job. There's not a producer in the world that does not want every actor to walk in to do well. Yeah. It may not seem that way to the actor at the moment. I agree. But I they want everybody to do well because they want that good problem of, oh my God, who do I cast? Exactly. We have that here in Chicago. And I think even from an audience standpoint, I think we have the smartest audiences too. Without Because an audience will Without follow a, a show and get involved in the show and give a show a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, where... In, in New York, many times are very fickle, especially in London, actually. <laughs> so if I can wave my magic wand, I'm waving. And what's your dream part? Oh, if you could play a part right now, what would That be? has changed for me over the years. It's not a dream part. It is a dream way of how I do my business. Tell me. I have delved recently into solo performance. I've written two shows of my own, and I'm pushing myself out there as heartily as I can. These last three years for me, uh, that's been a goal of mine. I finally found out last month that I, I got my first booking wow. <laughs> after three years. I have the temerity to think I can do something on Winston Churchill, which means I can shave this godforsaken beard off <laughs> and actually look like somebody else. Uh, that's where my dream has taken me. Uh, parts, sure. Everything from Shakespeare to Harold oh, yeah, Hill yeah, yeah. to uh, anything in between. Uh, the good actor just wants the next part. But that has to be so personal to you now. It's extremely personal. It's like your uh, baby. Uh, yes, it is. I, I want to be able to share that with other actors and be an example to show them they can create their own opportunity without having to go through the regular process. Yeah. So let me ask you this question then, writing your own work and, and you're going to okay. be in it. <laughs> how how, do, it. you, how okay. do you know um, when to let it go? Because I, I've been seeing this happen, like with a couple of productions that are going on, where they're, um, you know, where they're one person shows. Because there's never, no, there's no, no such thing as a one person show. No, I not mean, really. No. But I mean, at what point for you, with the actor's ego and then the writer, you know, mm -hmm. will you just say, I need to step back and hand this over? Michael, I have yet to discover that. I'm not there yet. Will you know when you're there? I don't know. i got to be honest. See, uh, I find this every, fascinating, yeah. the people that write, write, and yeah. do yeah. their own everything that like Everything it. that I'm writing is aimed at what I feel I have to offer. Right. Yeah. Yes, there will be a time when I have to step back, but to be perfectly honest, until I can see it in front of people, stand there and look them straight in the eye, I don't know when that will happen. And that doesn't mean that you're giving it up, though. You know, people, oh, not at all. people oh, no, no, start no. work and then come no, back yeah. to it all the time. No, but but at some point you do have to hand it off, and and because yeah. an audience is going to get it at some point. Yeah, they yeah. are. You know, and a director's going to get it. 
you know. And I hope you're there when it happens. I, I'm going to be. I, I'm, I'm glad I know about yeah. this now, so we can talk about <laughs> it. Oh, back to you. Sure. <laughs> you, honey. Um, <laughs> dream part. Um, Don't tell me. You're writing your own play. And <laughs> ah! Tevia and... Um, right now, at um, where I'm at right now, I wouldn't mind playing uh, Jack in Into the Woods. Seymour's on that list. Oh, that's right up your alley. Um, yeah. yeah. I like Avenue Q. I think uh, next to normal. I want you to say next to normal. Next to normal? They, I, think, I, think I actually game. got an email... Um, for a call for that. So we'll Good see life. what happens with that. Yeah, I see Gabe. Thank Gabe you. Gabe next to normal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what I'm pushing up there a little bit, I'd, uh, I definitely want to play Bobby and company when it comes around. That's, uh, that's definitely the dream role. Fantastic. Yeah. And in closing, what, what do you want people to take away from Schooner? The message of how important family is and how tradition holds you together. Uh, family is just so important. And not that I think people take it for granted, but it's nice to be reminded of how important the people in your life You get are very to emotional you. when you talk about this. Um, I have a wonderful family, and um, I'm the youngest of five. Mm -hmm. And within the next year, um, me and my siblings are all going to be spread across the country. And it's going to be the first time that that has ever been. Um, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, family's important. Pass it on. Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, I'm, I'm the other end of the spectrum. I, uh, I'm by myself. And um, I think what... I think... I, if there's anything in this show that I think stands out to me is that this is a simple, strong man who wants to do a good thing for someone. Yeah. And you can incorporate that into family, into tradition, into whatever realm you'd like. Um, but if people could take that, and uh, yes, I'm being a bit idealistic here, and do one good thing for somebody on a daily basis, yeah. Oh my God, Michael. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the moral of the story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I adore you. You know I do. Thank you, sir. And now I adore you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>